I was born in uh, Bartlesville, Oklahoma in the year 1920 and um, within a few years my parents had moved to Westfield, New Jersey where I grew up. Um, but upon reaching um, 18, I went to college at Purdue University. It was 700 miles from home. By train, it was, took a day. Um, I would say that my 95, 93 years uh, have been dominated by atomic bombs, um, um, war in particular, uh, World War II, and um, uh, by later by uh, uh, peaceful uses of atomic energy. Uh, and uh, what I will do is try to convey more or less chronologically what um, happened. Uh, first of all, um, I, ha I arrived at Purdue on the 7th of September uh, 1939. And uh, on the 1st of September, Germany had invaded Poland. The next day, Britain and France declared war on Germany. And it went on from there <coughs> uh, into uh, affairs military, which affected uh, the whole course of my life later on. The uh, Uh, the thing I remember particularly was that in uh, June of 1940, Paris fell to the Germans, and uh, then in August and September of that year, the uh, battle for the control of air over Britain uh, Peaked. That um, those sorts of situations made it very hard for me to um, concentrate on studies. Although I did fairly well on the first uh, uh, semester and second semester, and then in the summer I um, took uh, time to. Uh, do some experiments that I wanted to do on my own. One of them was to uh, measure the effect on the growth rate of bacteria in uh, petri dishes um, as a function of pressure, air pressure. And um, to do that, I needed to sterilize the petri dishes and the agar agar that the yeast would grow on. So I bought a uh, <coughs> uh, pressure cooker. It was just a, a vessel, um, you know, like a, a, a pan with uh, a top on it that you could latch down and had a relief valve on the top. And I was then living with a landlady um, as a tenant of hers and I would use her stove to heat the water in the vessel. Until doing that one time the uh, the pressure relief valve which sat uh, for some reason failed rose rapidly like a shot to the ceiling and stuck in her ceiling. 
After which she was no longer tolerant of my being in her house. So I had to find other quarters, but it was the beginning of an interest. In fact, it wasn't. It was a continuation of an interest in finding things out. And um, the, uh, I, I then was making part of the money by tuning pianos, which uh, I seem to have some tools for and maybe a little talent for, but uh, you can get your piano tuned for 25 cents. And uh, so that went on <clears throat> until, um, well, as I might say, at Purdue I was studying chemical and metallurgical engineering. Uh, however, um, when the next semester started, I couldn't concentrate on um, academics. There's too much going on in the world outside. So my parents arranged for me to go to Colgate College, uh, which I did. And the only three things I remember about Colgate, one is in the basement basement of the anatomy room, of the anatomy building, there were body parts in formaldehyde. And I remember uh, the smell of formaldehyde. Uh, second thing that happened while I was there was um, one of my classmates asked me to deliver a, a present for his girlfriend who lived in a sorority house. So I set out to do that, walked a nice afternoon, walked up to the sorority house, knocked on the door, when a pheasant flew over my right shoulder and dropped dead at my feet. When the house mother opened the door, all those girls had house mothers, and it's a good thing, um, I, ha I handed her the present <laughs> and the um, pheasant and fled. Now, if that pheasant had been an eagle that flew over my right shoulder and dropped dead, I would have been the emperor of Rome and Berlusconi would have been executed. But uh, the poor Italians had to suffer under his rule for some time. The, uh, while I was at Colgate, I still couldn't, couldn't concentrate on studies. And I went to Boston to join the Royal Air Force. And uh, to do that, there was quite a procedure but I didn't make it, but about 20,000 boys from the United States did. They joined either the Royal Air Force or the Royal Canadian Air Force and fought for Britain. Um, the reason I went was because the Brits had lost so many pilots in the battle over Britain which the British prevailed, and therefore Germany could not, uh, not controlling the skies, could not invade, uh, which was a, a, a big win for the Brits, but at great cost uh, for their young men. Um, so, uh, after failing at that, my Mother said, well, you come home for Christmas and then you better get back to school. Now, my father was wiser in his knowledge of boys. He said, you're going to go to work. So I went to Texas and worked in the um, oil fields in Texas and um, also got a job at teaching at night at the Tyler Junior College, is now Tyler University, um, um, 
uh, excuse me, mechanical drawing. Um, there weren't many girls in, um, I don't think there were any girls in the classes that I taught, but I can testify that the girls at Tyler Junior College were worth it. However, if we, I, if I messed around with them as a teacher, I would be, I would lose my job, or I would have to get married, or some other dire consequence. Well, then, um, after spending four or five months doing that, I went back to Purdue in uh, 1941 and registered in Zen in September 1941. On December 7, 1941, the uh, Japanese destroyed the U.S. fleet in uh, Hawaii. And um, within a month and a half or two, I uh, volunteered for service in the Army, and they put me in a reserve unit and said stay in school, which, which I did. And, um, the, the things got pretty intense then because all the big schools went on, um, you know, fast track teaching and continuous. Uh, it was very intense work, and it was com I was completely absorbed in technical subjects like chemistry, physics, and so on. Uh, then. Um, then my unit, then uh, there was a lot of complaining about college kids not doing their duty. So the president in May um, 1943, uh, just a month before I was to graduate, um, uh, they activated my unit and sent us all to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, for 16 weeks of training for combat in North Africa. And uh, things were going, things were very rough in North Af Africa at that time. They needed reinforcements, and so we assumed we were headed that way. But. And by the way, there were no girls. There were 100,000 soldiers at Fort Bragg and no girls, um, which is uh, probably a good thing. Then, um, when we finished <coughs> that training, four of us were pulled out and sent to Clemson College in, I think it's in South Carolina. And uh, Ed Simsarian, Hank Wideman, me and Bill Sword, and they offered us appointments to West Point. Well, I'd almost finished college, and if you got the appointment, you were committed after graduation from West Point to another four years of service. That didn't sound like what best way to use my talents. Um, um, at least that's how I viewed it. Uh, then, um, well, Sword accepted the appointment, the other three of us, Simsarian, uh, Wideman, and me, stayed at Clemson, and we thought, good, they lost track of us, they don't know where we are. But uh, anyway, they did know where we were, and I was taken out of, or ordered to go to um, the University of Pennsylvania for further uh, courses in um, various things, but mainly chemical, metallurgical engineering. And I felt by then I was getting a real solid grounding in those subjects. The 
Um, but uh, uh, we were then called out of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I was or I was a, had the grand rank of a private first class, and I was given sealed orders that I was to be put on a train. I was in charge of 17 soldiers; they were all engineers, and. I was to take them to the place that my SEAL lawyers would tell me to take them after we got on the train and got going and hit a certain place on the route. The, the train was one. And outside of St. Louis, uh, we before we got to St. Louis, the train went into some sort of a marshalling yard where they rearrange the cars because some of them are going to different places. And some of my 17 soldiers were on one of the cars which was disconnected and taken away from us, from me, who was supposed to be in charge. I had the tickets too. And uh, so I went up to the conductor and said, if you don't get those boys back and get them back now, I'm going to call Army Intelligence, which is a complete bluff. I didn't know how to do that. But, and he said, don't worry, sonny boy. And he said, they'll, they'll, they'll appear, and they did. So we had a, then we went into St. Louis and said, in a couple hours, I guess, and then we had we changed trains to um, the I think it was called the Santa Fe Chief train that went all the way to Los Angeles, and my orders were to get off at Laney, New Mexico. I had no idea. In fact, when I first read it, I thought it said Mexico, and I wondered why are we going to Mexico. But being still that double checking, found out it was New Mexico. We got off there, and uh, <clears throat> and there was a bus expecting us. And we got on to one of those Army Green buses, and they took us down to 109 East Palace Street in Santa Fe, uh, which is now a famous historical place. And um, Oppenheimer's secretary, um, or one of her deputies, I'm not sure, met us. Uh, we counted off, I counted off my guys, they were all there. And uh, so they took us in a bus up to Los Alamos. And uh, that must have been, we arrived in Los Alamos probably near midnight. Uh, I know it was dark when we got to Lamy. Um, uh, they took us up and, and they put us in the standard army eight-man shack, we call them. They had two bunks on each side, uh, these four sides. And so we got some sleep. And when I, I woke, woke at first light, I was in an upper bunk. My clothes were hung sort of down below. I had nothing on but my underwear, I mean my undershort. And I peeked out of one eye and there was this creature combing very long hair and putting a, some sort of restraint around it in the back. And I thought, I'm in the wrong place. This must be a woman. Um, hut. Well, it, it turned out it wasn't. The man was an Indian, an American Indian, and he worked up on the hill as a janitor. At about six, they took us to breakfast, and interviews started at seven. My first interview, and by the way, we were uh, although we didn't quite appreciate it, part of the um, 
special engineer detachment sent by the army to give some support to the scientists because scientists don't necessarily know much about engineering. And uh, anyway, they needed, uh, you know, needed people to help them with their work. So my first interview was with Frederick Helmholtz. Uh, he was, had the problem um, of um, figuring out whether if they set off an atomic bomb in the atmosphere of the Earth, would it, the nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere go into a chain reaction and burn up the Earth's atmosphere? And, um, uh, you know, air is about 21% uh, average in oxygen and the rest of it is nitrogen, a few odd gases in it. Um, <clears throat> he asked me one question, how many combinations of nitrogen and oxygen as molecules are there? I named about six or seven. He said there's something like 14. Goodbye. I had flunked. So then I, next interview was with Arthur Charles Wall, uh, uh, about whom I will say more in, in a minute or so. <clears throat> uh, Art Wall um, asked me two questions. One was, how would I separate heavy elements um, if I were given the job to do it? Fortunately, thanks to the Carnegie Library in Westfield, New Jersey, I used to read Physics Review uh, from the time I was a sophomore in high school. And uh, um, so I said, oh, confidently, <laughs> uh, I would use the um, hot wire method, and all I knew about it was the name of it. <laughs> then he asked me, uh, who was my uh, quantitative analysis professor at Purdue. And believe it or not, his name was Andrew Carnegie. Um, not the man who founded the library because of his steel fortune. Um, Art said, all right, um, uh, you go over to that man who was standing in the lab, and he said, you help him with what he's doing. That man was Donald Master, who was uh, in civvies, but he was a, a Navy lieutenant. And uh, we had uh, the job of, we didn't have much plutonium then. Wall was running the plutonium chemistry book. Uh, uh, a chemistry group, and uh, uh, so Mastic and I, uh, after, you know, we did a number of different things. We were joined by a fellow named Jim Gergen, and who was also an SED, that is Special Engineering Detachment, and we were helping Art Wall with some experiments. Art Wall, by the way, was the person who was uh, actually was the one who found, physically found, plutonium uh, by doing chemistry on irradiated uranium that had been bombarded at the 60-inch cyclotron and uh, at Berkeley, California, uh, University of California, at Berkeley. Well, uh, Wall decided that I would uh, uh, run 
the radioassay lab, that is, uh, we would take uh, radioactive material and we were looking to measure plutonium um, and we would make the samples and send them to the counter, the people who counted how much was there by measuring the alpha radiation from plutonium. And uh, that, uh, that I did, I ran the uh, radioassay lab after learning a lot from Wall about ultramicrochemistry, that's where you, you are working with micrograms of plutonium, to uh, microchemistry where it was milligrams to gram level eventually. But when we started, we had nothing but micrograms there to work out chemical methods to purify it. This Wall's assignment purified plutonium chemically so that there was there were no light elements in it which if they were hit by an alpha particle would make neutrons and cause a pre-detonation of a nuclear weapon made of plutonium. So um, then um, Wall decided that I would go and help develop equipment to do the processes that he was specifying the chemistry for. And Liz Maxwell, Dr. Elizabeth Maxwell, took over the radioassay lab and um, I went and worked with a man named Dave Carrot from MIT and Jim Gergen, an SED uh, chemist, and uh, someone else there too, I may remember the name. Um, and we uh, were tasked with developing a, a bench top device to uh, use the chemistry, which was quite complicated, to uh, purify the plutonium sufficiently so it would work in a nuclear weapon. And uh, uh, so we fussed with that uh, for probably a good month when uh, Wall said, okay, you, you, you've done enough of that small stuff. Now, Lo, you are in charge of uh, designing and building the, what he called the wall later, the wall load device, which was a quite complicated set of condensers and valves and pots and other things to move liquids around. And the process specified was pretty difficult. It, it involved oxidation reduction reactions uh, using such things as um, oxalic acid, acetic acid, they're pretty mild stuff, but sodium bromate, which is a very strong um, uh, oxidizing agent, hydriotic acid was a very strong redu reducing agent, and diethyl ether, which, which is highly flammable and explosive, uh, used to be used as a anesthetic, but they stopped using it because in hospitals because it was so dangerous. And and also ammonium nitrate. That molecule is made up of ammonium, which is a strong reducing agent, and nitrogen oxide, which is a very strong uh, oxidizing agent, and therefore 
uh, when it is dry, it tends to auto detonate, which has recently happened just somewhere in the United States because they forgot about it. you have to be very careful with that stuff, and of course it's a favorite uh, uh, explosive material for terrorists now. But at any rate, that we kept in a bunker with you know heavy wall, concrete walls, and dirt over it. So if it did blow up, it wouldn't blow up the building we were working in. And we don't use relatively small amounts each time. And one of the challenges in um, this job I was given to develop the what later became the wall load device, uh, we we had to find materials which wouldn't contaminate the stuff we were trying to purify, and uh, as a result of that, all of the um, all of us, Gergen and I and others, had rudimentary skills in glass blowing to make simple condensers and other things, pot. But we had to have used pure silicon dioxide, which is a fundamentally the, the fundamental component of glass. Uh, uh, and we didn't know how to do that. So I told the Army, we don't know how to do that. Uh, we've got to get somebody that knows how to do it. And typical of the X priority exercise by the Army, the confidence of the Army procurement people, within a week, or maybe 10 days, they brought in four Hungarian glass blowers. They did not speak English. I had to communicate with them by drawings and sign language. And they, um, they were very eager, eager to do, do it right. And they learned how to do, make these the bigger pots were a challenge. There were two of them in each the purification apparatus. They were about, oh, 10 or 12 inches in diameter with a hemispherical bottom, and then they had a lid that went on top. So that problem was solved. But we, we, we had done an, an enormous number of corrosion tests to find out what materials would work with these aggressive chemicals we were going to use. And so uh, the next uh, problem was how to make the lid on the top of these pots. And the only material that we could find was tantalum. Um, people didn't know much about tantalum. There was a professor at, at Washington University in St. Louis who had a side operation where he made stuff like tantalum. The Army went in, beefed up the capability of his factory, and within two weeks I had a little ingot of tantalum which we could use to measure the chemical and physical properties of which we knew how, which we needed to know. I had that ink. It, uh, that little ingot for years, it was about an inch in diameter and maybe an inch thick, something like that. Um, there, were, there were other things where it, we were a very small but not un, unimportant part of the Manhattan District uh, effort, which was huge. And uh, I later came to admire the General Grove's executive capability for that and other reasons. Uh, when we got 
Um, so we knew what materials had to be used, and we knew how to get the machine shop and the glass blowers to make the stuff. Uh, we, we were having trouble with flexible uh, hoses, or small hoses, about mm, quarter inch in, in max of an internal diameter. And at Columbia University, they had just discovered um, trifluoroethylene as an almost inert material to everything. And it was flexible, and it was, uh, so we got some, and it worked. And it's, um, it, it, was, it wasn't trichloro, that was tetrachloro. Ethylene. Later on, that stuff as a different, slightly different compound, um, 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 bi fluoro, bi chloro ethylene, is the stuff that's on your frying pan. The, um, you know, is inert and. Uh, resistance of cutting and so forth. The, um, at any rate, by October, I went to, Wall hired me in March, and by October we had a full-scale operating uh, thing that we could do dry runs on operating device, which had, by the way, more parts, more important parts in it, there, there are letters in the alphabet. And uh, then um, we had to work, well, when, when Wall hired me, I was 23 and he was 25. And uh, Seaboard, Seaboard was his teacher in graduate school, Glenn Seaborg, who got many Nobel Prizes um, for transuranium element discoveries. Um, Seaborg, I'll divert for a moment, Seaborg gave Wall a copy of a book uh, that Seaborg wrote. He was very meticulous about keeping records, and he wrote a book called Plutonium. It's a <laughs> coffee table book. It's probably eight and a half by eleven, but about four inches thick. And Wall and, and Seaboy wrote in the fly leaf of that book uh, a um, said to my best my first and best graduate student. That was Wall. And later, years later, Wall said, here, I want you to have this book. And I said, no, I'll get one. But you have a son, and you should give it to him. So maybe, maybe Art right, Wall did that. So, um, at any rate, we went through a lot of development, uh, dry runs and so forth, to make sure the equipment worked. And then Wall said to me, you are responsible for receiving and purifying all the material we receive from the Hanford Works, which is the only source of plutonium of any amount at that time. And so I was in charge, put in charge of that group, which may be 20, 15 or 20 people. And it required training and organization and, you know, dry runs and making sure people know what, knew what they were doing. And we had been very careful in designing to try to avoid uh, accidents by using explosive mine safety appliance, 
um, explosion detection equipment, explosion proof electric motors and so forth. Um, and controlling the airflow so that uh, the operators wouldn't get uh, breathe plutonium because this, the medical group under Hempelman had set one micro theory, that's one million, uh, sorry, one microgram, that is one millionth of a gram of plutonium as the upper limit of body burden for a 70 kilo man. They didn't mention women, and, uh, but it applied to everybody. And the one, we had, a, that was our target. We had to stay below one um, microgram by ingestion or inhalation getting inside of any of the workers. And one of the tricks was to have control of airflow so that, uh, around the equipment so that all the air was flowing away from the operators. And then the operators wore coveralls, boots, rubber gloves, um, <coughs> uh, light goggles, uh, hair covers, and uh, other things, and, and we developed, not we, but the, the health group developed uh, a way to clean their hands with citric acid, which is the basic component of citrus fruits, which seemed to work pretty well in cleaning up um, your hands and what might have been contaminated. Then, uh, so we worked on to produce the plutonium. We went on processing, producing probably what was the world's most pure substance ever produced. Um, that is um, a plutonium oxalate that was given to the metallurgist uh, to uh, turn in the metal. And uh, the, uh, it was pretty intensive, around the clock, every day, seven days a week. And uh, we had to have procedures which avoided putting together enough plutonium so that it would go critical, because then it would issue bursts of radiation which would kill people. And as a matter of fact, that happened to a man named Cecil Kelly, who worked for me, not in my operation, but in a related one uh, after the war. But we went on and produced the plutonium for, for the Trinity test on, I think, July 14th, 1945. And uh, for combat number one and combat number two, and I think we were working on combat number three, when uh, the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan. And Japan surrendered after uh, a revolt uh, by officers who wanted to continue the war, their officers, Japanese officers who wanted to continue the war, and uh, and the Americans moved in first to Japan, and uh, therefore the Russians weren't quite ready to do that, and uh, the U.S. took over all of the all of Japan. Uh, if the bomb hadn't been dropped, 
uh, the Russians probably would have taken the upper half of Japan, the northern half, and it would might well have turned into another North Korea, which is a rogue state. So there were big issues uh, which were uh, uh, resolved in the U.S. favor by the bomb itself. And as Churchill said, uh, to invade Japan would have cost about a million U.S. lives and half that many of Brits. Uh, and the, Japan, the Japanese were tough. They, didn't, they were not about to surrender. And meanwhile, at the personal level, I had two brothers in the Pacific. One was, uh, he, he went to Brown University he, uh, under the P-12 program, which was to produce naval officers. Uh, after they finished their academic, he graduated uh, from somebody from Brown. He was captain of the football team. And he went with his newly minted fellows to fly out to the Pacific, but first they stopped and they went to the top of the Mark Hopkins Hotel, which was the place to go then, and they were going to have a beer. And my, uh, my brother's uh, companions got their beer, but my, the waitress asked my brother for his ID identification papers. And he was not yet 21. They would not serve him. And yet he was going off to fight a war in Japan, in the Pacific, with, um, uh, and they wouldn't let him drink beer. And in the process of his job over there, he was uh, stabbed in the stomach by people who were under him. Uh, probably by mistake, they were they were into a knife fight um, down in the hold of a ship full of explosives, and he went down a cargo net to stop the fight, and he thinks it was an accident. Uh, they weren't after him, but um, who knows? Then, uh, on on Christmas Eve, after the war was over. He was on a little island in Japan, and he and some buddies went out to have a beer. And meanwhile, uh, riots had broken out. The court martial system, all guys capable of running a court martial system, had left, and the uh, a riot broke out where people were shooting at each other, and uh, he got winged. He got hit in the front, right near an artery, but it missed. And of course, those bullets were designed to expand, once, which they did. So he had a big thing on his back, but that we got that fixed, and uh, so he. And, and meanwhile, my kid brother was a sergeant in the army on a Philippine island, and uh, a marine pilot flew in in his Corsair without putting his wheels down on, pur on purpose. He did it, I guess, um, and he slid to a stop, jumped out, and said, "The war is over. The war is over." And my brother said, oh yeah, we heard that one before. Well, the war was over. Uh, they didn't believe it for three days where he was. Finally they got, he said there was a little notice, hardly bigger than um, small newsprint, put up that the surrender, Japanese had surrendered. Also, at the time the 
they come in by radio and time the Marine pilot <laughs> bellied in his Corsair fighter. Then, um, however, there are 125,000 Japanese in, in uh, Korea. And uh, uh, my brother's outfit made a combat landing uh, full, you know, armed and ready to shoot. Uh, not knowing if the Japanese on the island had gotten the word. Well, it turns out they had. Um, the Japanese army was pretty well disciplined. Well, uh, let's see, that sort of is a Los Alamos story. After that, I went to Hanford, Washington, had programmed programmatic responsibility for uh, three new reactors and the new laboratory that were to be built there. And typical of accomplishment by innocence, Gordon Dean, the newly appointed chairman of the AEC, which I worked for there, came in and I was to escort him around. I said, well, Mr. Dean, where do you work? And um, <laughs> fortunately, he was a diplomat. He said, I work in Washington, <laughs> not I am your boss. <laughs> and uh, so uh, in the process of There are a lot of stories about Hanford, but I'll try to make them, I'll try to shortcut them. One is that um, <clears throat> in the rea reactors which were operating, um, the graphite pile in them through which the tubes went that carried the fuel, but, um, reacted to make the plutonium were sent to us, uh, were swelling. That wasn't good because the control rods dropped by gravity and if the, uh, their pathway was obstructed by bends in the pathway, uh, <coughs> that, that could be pretty serious, although they had backup systems beyond that. Uh, to stop the reaction, but the uh, uh, one of the guys from uh, University of Washington, professor of physics, said, "Well, why don't we put some carbon dioxide into the uh, nitrogen blanket, nitrogen gas blanket that covers the." Uh, covers the reactor inside of its containment. And so that was done and it worked. The atoms which had been knocked out of their lattice by the radiation that was going on in the reactor jumped back into place and the graphite uh, cube, about 20 foot by 20 foot by 20 foot cube, uh, contracted back to where it was supposed to be. And some of us said, hey, what about what's happening to Earth's atmosphere? And uh, uh, we said, well, isn't it going to heat up? And this was 1950. And uh, yeah, it was probably going to heat up. And so we, and one of the guys, an assistant professor at the University at Washington, at the University of Washington, uh, who was working with us, said, put out a, every month he put out a thing called the CO2 News, and uh, 
that was the beginning of my concern and a few others about global warming and the, the, what effects it would be. Uh, and then Keeling went out, <laughs> another man focused on uh, measuring what was in the atmosphere, went out on Mauna Loa in Hawaii and he measured uh, carbon, among other things, carbon dioxide concentration. And then he did that for several years and then he said the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is rising. And that was a real yellow flag. But still, only a few people believed it. Just a few. Some at Oak Ridge, which was a uh, Manhattan uh, generated laboratory, Man uh, Manhattan district generated laboratory. Um, some at the University of Washington. Here and there, uh, people began to really worry, including me. Not that we ever got anything done about it. After, uh, uh, well, another um, story about the Hanford situation. Uh, <clears throat> a man, a tough character from, who was probably 30 years older than I was, who had been building dams out west, was brought in to head construction at Hanford, and I was assigned to him. His name was John I. Thomas. He walked into the... Uh, we had a big construction program, which I had programmatic responsibility for, three new reactors and new labs. And he walked out to the site, he spent a day there and he found people sleeping and not without any plans for what they were going to do tomorrow. He came back and he shut down the whole site. They didn't, he said, those buses are not going to go out until every man or woman has their name on their hat with a hat colored for their craft and um, with a day plan to know what they're going to do the next day. And uh, then he went out and checked that they'd done that. And it transformed the whole operation, a huge operation out there. It was a lesson in how you ma manage things firmly, is the answer. Um, after uh, uh, Bath, I decided, after um, Hanford, I decided I wanted to do something else, and I applied for jobs around the country, um, and I found that my boss, the, Dave Shaw, the, um, or he my boss one level up, two levels up, um, had put out the word that nobody was to hire me. They wanted me to stay there. The only person who responded uh, was a fellow named John Newell in Maine who ran what was called the Bath Iron Works. Bath Iron Works built the best destroyers ships uh, ever built by the U.S. Navy probably during World War II, and um, he wanted to know, so he paid my way back to um, uh, Bath, Maine, and he said, can we make a nuclear destroyer? And I sat down and did back of the envelope stuff and said yes. Uh, and uh, the destroyer then, not, the, uh, not a uh, 
small ship. It was 2,000, the stories were 2,000 ton ships. And uh, uh, so I, so he hired me. I went back to Bass Ironworks, in the, as far, almost as far as you could get away from the state of Washington, where I'd been uh, in the United States. And at, uh, uh, and then I, then I, I began working with George Carey, who was the uh, uh, naval architect there. And uh, we fussed around with uh, trying to make the nuclear power plant lighter. And I worked with GE on the nuclear power plant part and for a destroyer. And it, but the ship got heavier and heavier and it finally got up to 6,000 tons because of shielding required. I made a growth underestimate in, uh, of what the ship might weigh. So we wanted to make a ship that was fast enough to catch a submarine. And a ship has difficulty doing that because it makes waves, whereas a submarine uh, doesn't make lose energy making it waves. It does lose energy by resistance through the water, but <clears throat> there was an experimental submarine called the Albacore at that time. And we, anyway, George Carey and I uh, finally settled. We went to the ship trials. We had access to all of uh, ship trials data. Those are the trials run on ships to find out how fast they'll go, how much fuel they burn, and all that stuff, after they, just after they've been built. <clears throat> we picked the cruiser Atlanta, the 6,000 ton ship, and George Carey says, I don't think we could launch this ship in the Canabac River. It's too big. Anyway, we went down to see Admiral Muma, who was the uh, chief of the Bureau of Ships. Uh, we were uh, proposing to build this ship and uh, use a GE engine in it. And um, uh, uh, Admiral Muma brought in Commander Rickover. And Rickover, <laughs> then a commander. And Rickover literally came in ranting and raving and literally foaming at the mouth. Just raging hell. We didn't know anything about ships. We didn't know how to build them. We didn't know anything about nuclear power plants for ships, which was the latter part was true. Fortunately, uh, he was right. Uh, fortunately, we didn't get any job at Bath to build a nuclear ship. Bethlehem Shipyard did, and they went broke building it, building the first one, which turned into the cruiser Long Beach. He built it, and uh, the. Uh, uh, and we were 3% over budget. And uh, so Washington office sent out a man named James K. Pickard and a lawyer named Harold Green. And um, they investigated things and said, well, it's, you know, it's pretty good shape. James K. Pickard later became my partner. Harold Green later became a judge who broke up the AT&T monopoly. So we were all growing up, I guess. <laughs> um, 
so after that, I went, decided to go in the peaceful applications of, of uh, nuclear power, although the things were still dominated by nuclear weapons. As Churchill put it, right after, the, <clears throat> because it was in March of 1946, in his speech at uh, Fulton, Missouri, uh, an iron curtain has descended from, no, the other way, from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste on the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended behind which are all the old capitals of Europe. And if we, and it says, if we stand together, we have nothing to fear. Stand together became NATO. Um, the Iron Curtain was what the Russians put up. Um, <clears throat> so at any rate, there was still a Cold War going on when uh, all the time that I was working on peaceful applications. And uh, I did personally work on one third, no, one quarter of all the 104 nuclear units built in the United States. And uh, most of those are still operating uh, way beyond their design life. But uh, they have uh, programs to keep them in shape, and uh, we uh, uh, also uh, picked the first, we were asked by the State Department to help the Germans build a nuclear reactor, so we said, well, build a small one, start small teach people with it, and we uh, uh, picked one. It was a G G General Electric plant, and uh, the, uh, at one point, um, the German sent, well, the guy running the German program was named Henry Mandel, and he late, later became the chief executive officer of the Rhine-Westphalian Power Company, the biggest one in Germany. But at that time he was just a kid, well, he was probably 30, and uh, he was going to get married, so we bought him a standing lamp. That's what he wanted. We bought him a standing lamp. That was the first piece of furniture he had for his marriage. Anyway. Uh, that wasn't why we got the job, but the, uh, in the process of working with the Germans, they sent two Germans to the United States, and I decided, well, the thing to do is take them out to lunch at the German-American restaurant in Washington. Um, and we had some beer and we were feeling pretty good, or sort of, for mature people. And one of them started describing um, his job during the war, how he took firing angles on U.S. ships. I thought, those are our ships he's talking about. He was a German U-boat commander. Not many of them survived, but he was one of them. The other guy was a physicist, and so I spent many months in Germany uh, after the war, uh, but mostly in the United States working on setting the general parameters for the construction of the nuclear power plant. 
which were designed and built by Babcock and Wilcox or General Electric or Westinghouse. Um, in the, then there was a TMI accident. Um, the, uh, I got a call, uh, General Public Utilities was owned it. Um, there, one of their uh, chief engineers called me and said, well, something's going on at Unit 2 and we don't know what it is, but we're really one um, milliram, that's uh, one one thousandth of a Rankin radiation level at the guard shack, which shouldn't happen. So I went up and they had a big meeting on, um, there, were, there were probably 20 people in the meeting, um, um, and the topic was uh, uh, restart of Unit 2. They, they weren't thinking about, they were there to get the place restarted. And, uh, but at the end of the meeting, a fellow named George Kuzer, who was a technical support director, came up to me. And he'd been up 36 hours trying to, 38 hours, trying to figure out what was happening at the, at the plant. And he got me, he gave me what you would call a verbal uh, data dump, just continue with talking. He couldn't stop talking. He was telling me everything he knew, what he didn't know, why they couldn't figure things out. Entirely different from what this restart large group was supposed to do. And uh, I thought, that, that doesn't sound right to me. I mean, they don't understand what's going on. And uh, so when Jack Irvine, the Vice President for Nuclear Matters for General Public Utilities, went to call the governor, I got a, got a hold of him and said, the problem is not restart, it's uh, to stabilize the unit and some of us better get up to the control room and try to figure out what's happening. Well, Jack came storming back into the room, he was a naval type, came storming, storming back into the room with all these guys and he said, uh, I want some of you to go to the control room and find out what's happening. And since I had suggested I couldn't gracefully back out of it, and Tom Crimmins, who was a <clears throat> uh, graduate of the U.S. Uh, uh, Merchant Marine School, USMM School, um, he volunteered. There were two of us. We went to the control room and it was strange. They, the, the, the machine wasn't behaving the way it, it ought to behave. And <clears throat> I won't go into the details, but it was in, unstable. And the operators couldn't get on top of it. They didn't know what was going on. And a young guy came up to me, named Richard William Benzel, and he showed me a trace of containment building uh, pressure. Now, first of all, containment building is about 30 to 40 feet in diameter and 150 feet high very strong reinforced concrete. Inside the equipment is the 
pressure vessel that where the fuel is is about 20, 20 feet in diameter, no, maybe 15, and about 30 feet tall with uh, two to three inch steel uh, boundaries. At any rate, they couldn't get control of the water level in the uh, in the primary system and <clears throat> kept bouncing around. <clears throat> and when Benzel showed me this diagram, there was a big spike in pressure in the containment and then it dropped fast. At the same time that it spiked, when it hit the top, the huge sprays at the top sprayed and knock the pressure back down. And all of a sudden, all of what George Cooner had told me and what I was seeing on that diagram and had learned by being in the control room coalesced almost instantaneously. And I said uh, to Crimmins, we got a pot full of hydrogen. There's been huge damage to the core. Uh, we got to find out how much hydrogen is there. And some youngster was on a telephone to the B&W designers in Lynchburg, Virginia, and I just commandeered the telephone and I said, who's this? And he says, well, this is Taylor and Nishi we're sitting here, what's going on? And I said, we got a problem. We got a pot full of hydrogen. Uh, we get, don't know how big it is. Uh, we've got to, uh, so give me, stay on the line. I knew them both. They were good guys. And, uh, it, and uh, they said, some of them said, sort of facetiously, you mean we're not going to sleep? And I said, no. And um, uh, meanwhile, I was an outsider, you know, I was just consultant to these guys, to the power company. So, um, um, uh, I, I said, I want you to give me the volume, the free volume, uh, within the primary system up to the main nozzles, which are near the top of the pressure vessel. And, <clears throat> and, and fast. So they came back in about five minutes and they got, they probably already, you know, they pulled out a drawing and had it. And we got that and I said, we got them. I said, I called I think I was talking to the president of GPU, and I, no, I wasn't, I, their vice president for uh, Bob Arnold for nuclear stuff. I said, you, we got, get the best man you've got over here. We need some help. He sent over a guy named Jim Moore, and I said, Jim, we got to find out <coughs> how big that bubble is. You know, there's, there's still a hypothetical bubble. Um, I mean, it seemed like a long time, but probably only a couple of minutes, he said, Boyle's Law ought to work. And before he even finished the sentence, I said, we have a piston to find out uh, to change the pressure. And Boyle's Law says, everything else being perfect, that <clears throat> the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the pressure on it. And so I said to, uh, I called over Joe Logan, who was the uh, unit superintendent, the next Navy uh, nuke ship commander. I said, Joe, uh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't Logan, it was, um, with pencil. I said, you see that trace? Get me a 
confirmation that there's other evidence that that trace is right. He says it's right on the same sheet, the two different instruments. One was a big range and one was a small range. And so I called, I went up and got Joe Logan brought him back to the back of the control room and I said, <coughs> <coughs> we got to change, I, I'd like you to change, they were at 800 pounds per square inch internal pressure. I want you to change the pressure 100 pounds uh, per square inch up or down and read me the change in vol volume that you get. And he, he said, he looked puzzled and I said, look Joe, I don't know how to work the knobs and, and uh, uh, buttons on, on the control board. You guys got to do that, but that's what we need to do. And I said, um, do you agree to that? And he sort of mumbled. I said, do you, I said, do you agree to that? We still can. And uh, <coughs> so then um, uh, Benzel says, um, we already have that data. I mean, that was done yesterday. We changed a, about a hundred pounds and we measured a change in, in uh, volume. <clears throat> Actually, the volume changed with the level of the pressure in the pressurizer and the level of water in the pressurizer. Um, <clears throat> so that and, and then Crimmins and I had been taught, you know, well, wait a minute, under stress you tend to lock him to a, to a solution to something that may be wrong. <coughs> so look, sit down, <coughs> talk about it. We did for maybe five minutes or so. We figured, yeah, sounds like it. And I said, well, to more, now you calculate the volume of the bubble under Boyle's law, Boyle's law, and I will do the same independently and see if we get the same answer. So we got more or less the same answer. And uh, at that point, uh, a lot of people um, began uh, calling the control room, wanting to know what happened. And I talked to a few of them, not many. Um, I thought about calling Joe Hendry, who was a very good scientist, and he was the head of the uh, uh, Atomic Energy Commission. And Jimmy Carter was all over it to get some answers. And I thought, no, I'm not going to call Joe Hendry, because if I do, all hell's going to break loose. They'll send people in here and we won't be able to work. So I didn't call him. And he said afterward, he said, it sure would have made my life easier if you had, <laughs> but it would have made ours impossible. At any rate, we kept working on the problem and I, I time marked my calculations of the amount of the core destroyed and got an answer of uh, 200, no, that, about 11 p.m. I made a calculation uh, about to estimate the amount of the core destroyed, got 200% of it had been destroyed. Well, that <laughs> didn't, didn't work, but it was enough to say there is a major problem. And uh, so we went on, and at 4 a.m., I time marked the calculation, corrected for several errors I had made in the original one and came out with 50%. It turned out a year later when it got in there. Um, 
essentially all of it had been destroyed. And out of the hundred ton of tons of fuel in there, about 30 tons had gone to, um, to the bottom of the reactor vessel. Twelve days before that, Jane Fonda had put out a movie called The China Syndrome. It was a lousy, from a technical point of view, it was a real fiction. Um, however, my wife Sylvia called one of my guys in Washington said, what's going on, Tom? And he said, we're waiting for a statement from Jane Fonda. <laughs> so much for TMI, or too much for it. Um, I suppose that's about the end of it, except I, well, there's one other thing. Uh, Jim Pickard, Fred Warren and I, in our outfit called Pickard, Warren and Lowe, decided to set up a separate operation <clears throat> to become much larger. We wanted to stay small, but we would own a separate operation. It was called the Nuclear Utility Services. And we brought in people to run that. And I was on the board of it. And on that board was a man who probably did more to get the U.S. Navy up to date after the war than uh, Admiral Charlie, uh, Charles Burr, Arlie Burr. Uh, he was on the board. And uh, he, he, was, he was the guy who transferred, destroy, uh, who transformed destroyer tactics during World War II almost single-handedly. Um, and then after that, uh, brought the Navy up very uh, much in terms of its technology and all that. Joe Williams was a pistol. He was a guy who did not go to Annapolis. He didn't wear the ring, but he was a, came up through the ranks and was an extremely good officer, both a narrow and a broad way. Anyway, he went to work for me after the war, and um, I was asked after TMI to go to Spain, <clears throat> help them get their two reactors in northern Spain started. Uh, they've been attacked by terrorists, and they killed a couple of guys. And so I said to Joe Williams, Let's, you can go with me, and we'll go over there and see what we can do. So we did. And um, we got them pretty well organized and, <clears throat> and ready to go when the ETA, the terrorist organization, uh, took the manager of the plant, uh, named O'Reilly, um, prisoner, and they said, if you don't tear the plant down in 24 hours, we're going to kill him. And of course, you can't, you can't do that. And so they did. They killed him, threw his body out on the street. So then uh, we regrouped, and I got a, name, a guy named Chuck Eulis to help who knew some politics and stuff applicable to northern Spain. And we got, um, uh, and the chief economic minister for the Basque provinces said he, he took a year and he went out to all of his political clubs and got them to uh, agree to, to get the big 
bank of Spain, Santander, to buy the nuclear power plants. Uh, they thought the problem was that the uh, a number of the old directors of the power company which owns those plants were uh, Franco's men, the dictator of Spain. And so they thought if the, they let the uh, set up a different structure, that would work. So that was done, and we went back to Spain to try to get it started. And we looked like that was going to be started, restarted. And we had a new plant manager in, and guess what? The ECA chapter do plant made the same demands, killed that guy and threw, threw him out on the street. And, um, the plant never restarted, and Spain had to buy its power in North Spain from France. I think that should be the end of my story. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a dramatic ending. I remember an incident uh, just after the war uh, when I was sitting outside at my desk uh, outside the door to Art Wall's uh, little office, and Seaboard came down uh, and uh, to Los Alamos and met with Art Wall as I was sitting there. The wall was in his office, and. Um, <clears throat> I didn't hear what they said to each other, <clears throat> but after that was all over, and I don't recall exactly when, Art said that um, uh, Glenn Seaborg had come down and proposed that he, Seaborg, and Wall be uh, designated the discoverers of, of the element plutonium. And Wall said that he would add two more names to that and would, in, he said, implied he was insisted two other names be added. One was Joe Kennedy who had built the instruments that made the measurements possible that demonstrated the discovery of plutonium. And Emilio Segre, who already had a Nobel Prize for discovering technetium, um, be included also, that the four of them be included as the discoverers and since um, they basically own the rights to the element plutonium, uh, because uh, they worked for Berkeley, but Berkeley didn't have the modern type of policy where the school kept a patent, that they be, uh, that that group of four be the discoverers from whom the U.S. government was to buy the rights to the element plutonium. And as a result of that, um, I believe, it's probably in the record somewhere, but the number I remember, each of them was paid $100,000. And, um, and the U.S. government then um, essentially owned the rights to plutonium, which was important because of the nature of the use of plutonium in atomic weapons. So while you were at Los Alamos, um, Art 
report, well, reported directly to Joe Kennedy as the director of the chemical uh, division. Yeah. Well, um, Kennedy was, I'm not quite sure of the scope of his job. Um, there were people above him. It, was, it wasn't a highly hierarchical organization, but Eric Jetty was above him uh, uh, because he also had the, because the uh, um, division that Jetty, Jetty ran also included the metallurgist, um, such as Ed Hamill. They, uh, all and the metallurgists were extremely talented group. Uh, in any event, that's how I remember it. So, and what do you recall of Joe Kennedy? Um, tall, thin, sort of relaxed, appeared to be. Um, very quick of mind, though. And I do remember one embarrassing incident when I first got there. Art Wall asked me to make up a sample to send to the uh, counters that Kennedy had devised. And um, I miscalculated and sent too much. And all Wall said to me was, you ruined one of the counters, and um, off he went. But then <laughs> Kennedy's group, you know, it took him about half a day to get another one built uh, with all the support they had from the machine shop. So it did ruin the counter. Mm. <laughs> At least it didn't uh, go, it wasn't enough to create a criticality. Oh, criticality was a very important safety problem, and um, one of the issues was to decide how much you could put together safely. And the general rule was that you could put two of them together, and they would not go critical in water solution. And the person who estimated um, what, at one point, what the criti criticality in solution would be of plutonium, I think the answer was about 500 grams in water solution in the right con geometry, um, was calculated by Klaus Fuchs, um, who turned out to be giving the Russians all the information about how to build the atomic bomb. And later on, I understand, he also gave it to the Chinese, believing in equal rights, I suppose, or something. And apparently he didn't do it for money. But I went to him at one point to ask him what would happen if a solution went critical, because my guys were in... <laughs> in danger if it did. And he said, well, the water would boil. And that's right, the, wa the water would boil. It would also kill a couple of people, as it did with Cecil Kelly. So did you uh, learn have any inkling that Klaus Fuchs was a spy? No. No, I had that really drove a wedge between British intelligence and U.S. intelligence. He got 15 years in the pen, and, and if he'd been in the United States, he would have been hung. I mean, if the United States had him and had caught him. What about, did you know David Greenglass? He's a... Yeah, he, I think he was a machinist, I'm not sure. But I knew later about him. I didn't know him personally. Of course, the Russians also had a spy group in Canada. There was a parliamentarian 
Canadian parliamentarian, I believe his name was Rose, who was sending him, sending him up to date information on the status of things at the Hanford reactors. And um, <clears throat> I once had a copy of some kind of transmission that, were, that was introduced into evidence describing um, how many grams of plutonium would be made per megawatt day in a reactor and um, of the xenon problem, that was a problem where not understood at first, when the growth of xenon uh, from fission would shut, tend to shut the reactor down. And the solution to that was to learn how to override the xenon until it came to uh, keep the reactor going until the xenon came into equilibrium. And uh, I think the Rose Group told them all about the xenon problem. So Los Alamos then, as now, was leaking like a sieve, or now it would be back at the Wan, you know, when Wan Ho Lee lost six hard drives or whatever it was. One of them he gave to his daughter because she needed a hard drive, he said. I, I didn't know him personally, but <laughs> the best description of him is, is, is in that book by Janet uh, Conant, the granddaughter of James Bryan Conant, um, <clears throat> describes him, what well, I know of him, but more importantly, others who knew him well say, said, uh, was a very good description of him. And, uh, one of Grove's many capabilities was that he picked Oppenheimer. Um, Oppenheimer was a third level physicist, but he knew the business and somehow he was able to get others to you know, do their thing. I, I went to almost every colloquia I could get to. And to listen to the seniors hammer on problems. And Oppenheimer never in, ended a sentence. He would start talking and he would go into dependent clause after dependent clause and finally come back um, to the main track. And then after quite a while he'd shut up and the <laughs> Other guys would start arguing with me uh, about how to do this or that. So how effective were those gatherings, those colloquia? I think they were very effective. Uh, for example, a number of the problems, num uh, uh, some major problems, <clears throat> solutions, so uh, solutions for some major problems were proposed by people not working on the problem or maybe not even skilled in the work. And what, the example of that, I think it's an example of that, was uh, when the man from Stanford, I, maybe it was Christie, um, uh, said, well, you can't make a gun-type weapon out of plutonium. It's too slow assembly. What you have to do is make a, an implosion weapon, whereupon they brought Kiskikowski down from Harvard, who was the only one that really knew about how to make explosive lenses in an innovative way. And they got other guys that knew how to uh, 
coordinate the absolutely accurate timing of setting off the lenses so that the explosion wave arrived at the compression of the of the little sphere, the center of the bomb, uh, were at the same time as it would squeeze it instead of blowing it apart. And that, that was an awfully difficult problem to solve. But by the way, the purification process in the official history, that the purification process that Art Wall devised, and I was supposed to devise the equipment to do it, uh, was the most difficult, second most difficult problem uh, at Los Alamos. First most difficult was the implosion. Um, when you're talking about purification of the plutonium, you're yeah. talking about having to take what was produced in the reactor at Hanford and kind of trying to remove some of the impurities? Uh, they, <clears throat> they, they, they removed essentially all of the fission products and when Los Alamos asked them to they finally got rid of most of the uranium that was with, with the plutonium. So those huge um, uh, canyons we call them uh, which were at least 400 yards long all automatically all uh, remote controlled equipment designed by DuPont. It's an amazing engineering accomplishment. Um, they, that, um, uh, yeah, they did, they did most of the purification. We did the final stuff, uh, which was more difficult chemically than what they did, but, uh, In fact, when I was at Hanford, it occurred to me that they, they could actually, from a criticality point of view, raise the uh, batch size that they processed without a risk of criticality. And I knew that because I knew about the water boiler experiments that had been done to set the criticality limits. Um, so I propose that it, uh, it be investigated to see if they could uh, raise the amount of plutonium in each batch that they process. And uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, in all innocence of everything, uh, I asked Los Alamos to send Teller and Fermi and Christie, the three preeminent <laughs> guards, to be on a committee to decide whether I was right about it. And, uh, and I was the secretary of the committee. Well, after the first meeting, they sent Los Alamos sent a uh, um, less prestigious but very competent physicist to monitor the experiments which were done to confirm what I had hypothesized. So it essentially doubled the throughput of the, of the canyon.